Sounds good. Uh, I think we chaired the meeting last time. So, uh, Josh, do you want to do it? Sure. Okay, thanks. Yeah, of course. All right, welcome everyone. We're going to call the uh, City of Davis DJ uh, USD 2x2 two two, uh, to order September 21st, uh, 2022. Let the record show it's 518. Um, Participants, uh, Trustee Joe Denunzio, Tom Adams, myself, Josh Chapman, they're present. Um, I also just want to point out one thing on the agenda. It still has vagueness here as the participant. So I don't know if that needs to probably should just be updated. So it's not out there floating around with her name still on the agenda. Thank or you not. for the correction. Sorry about that. No worries. It's all good. Uh, Josh, we put that there so she can have it, all assignments that we have. <laughs> I like that. It's a good idea, Tom. <laughs> um, all right, so moving forward, we'll have um, open up for public comment to any members of the public um, for any uh, may address this body for any issues uh, or any comments that are not related to um, anything on the agenda. So do we have any public comment, Kelly? I do see one raised hand. Okay. Commissioner Gavin, if you will um, mute yourself, you have up to three minutes for public comment. Um, hello, everyone. I'm calling in because I wanted to know to voice my opinion in regards to when schools closed because of the pandemic and uh, that was not the case for all of the schools in California and in some of the other states what they did was they downsized the classroom and the core subjects were taught so if they had 25 kids they had 12 kids in the morning for three hours and in the afternoon, they had the rest of the uh, classroom. And that was um, an alternative that some districts taught. It wasn't really discussed um, nationwide, and it, but it worked well for them. I think we have all learned it was an adverse, tremendous adverse impact on the schools being close to children and the children being isolated. And now we have a huge mental health issue among very young children. And um, I just wanted to mention that. And also very quickly, there was, an, I was on one of the committees and they mentioned a student council that would attend some of the meetings like with the school board or city council and that they would, um, they should receive a stipend and to get an understanding how government really works. So I don't ever know what happened to that, but I think that would be a very good thing for students who are interested to uh, actually see how government works and how the Brown law um, operates as well. Thank you. Thank you for that public comment. I don't see, I don't see any other raised hands. Okay. Thank you, Kelly. And I would note just in response to what the last public comment was, there is um, in our meeting last night, we had uh, representatives from, from SACOG there and they are taking applications for the Youth Leadership Academy, which is for students grade uh, 9th to 12th. Um, and they forward on some of that information, but it's uh, for getting students involved and engaged in, in their local politics, local political scene and engaged in city government. Um, so that's, that's out there and applications are now open um, and on their website, there's information for that, for, uh, for that as well. Um, so not seeing any other public comments, we will move on to approval of the May 18th, uh, 2022 minutes. Uh, is there a motion to approve those or any changes? So, uh, I'll move approval, Arnold. Um, and I will second that. Sorry, I right. couldn't find move. my microphone button. <laughs> Moved by Arnold and seconded by Adams. Uh, any comments or um, anything related to those minutes? All right. All in favor? We have to we do a roll call vote on this. We have to do that. Yeah, you need to do a roll call vote because okay. I'm seeing. All right. Uh, Councilmember Arnold. Aye. Uh, Trustee Denunzio. Aye. Trustee Adams. Aye. And myself, uh, Councilmember Chapman. And I. All right. Thank you. All right. Moving on. The agenda item number four, city district uh, communications. Um, do you want to start us off, Matt? 
Sure, uh, and I've, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about uh, most of these things uh, in my other comments, but we're, we're off and started this year. Um, it's been a great start of the school year so far and uh, looking forward to uh, the, the homecoming events this week. Hope to see you all at the parade on Friday. Pass it over to you, Mike. All right. Yeah, thanks very much, Matt. Um, what time yeah, you guys we... kick off the parade? I think it's 1.30. Okay. Yeah, good, good stuff. I mean, it's, um, yeah, we're definitely uh, back into the throes of the, the school year, fully underway with uh, the school district here, of course, but also with UC Davis. And so we had the, um, you know, we working with the downtown association and the chamber and so forth, you know, uh, had a big welcome event downtown uh, for the incoming uh, sort of new students at UC Davis. So we had, I think it was 9,000 uh, students roughly uh, that sort of descended upon downtown <laughs> this week. Um, Josh knows it all too well, being a, a downtown business owner. Um, but uh, I think, you know, overall it, it uh, went very smoothly, very, very good to be able to have that sort of uh, activity happening once again. Um, you know, post, uh, dare I say, post COVID, I, you know, I'm not sure what we're calling this phase that we're in right now. Um, but, uh, you know, with the greater return to, you know, in-person activities and so forth, it's, it's good to see the, the students in town, see the, uh, the economic activity that happens along with that, just the vibrancy around the community too. Um, and, you know, with it comes some challenges too, you know, we, at the same time, uh, had, uh, pretty torrential uh, downpour um, uh, over the course of about 24 hours in Davis. So that was pretty unprecedented. Um, had a couple of, you know, localized flooding issues just where, you know, some of the pumps and so forth got overwhelmed um, just because there was just so much volume of water in such a short period of time. Um, but everything I think is uh, pretty well caught up now and uh, drainage dealt with and, and so forth. Um, you know, and we'll be that much better prepared for the next storm that comes. Um, so, um, you know, and uh, we had a good council discussion last night, as uh, um, Council Member Chapman mentioned. Uh, we had uh, SACOG come, and Casey Lazon from SACOG come and present an update on the 2024 blueprint process that SACOG is undertaking. Um, and uh, you know, we, uh, other than that, you know, we're, you know, things are all sort of plugging away towards the uh, November elections. Uh, we have two of our council district seats that are, um, are up um, with the current incumbents of Dan Carson and Gloria Partita, their districts um, up for election in November. And, and then we've had some discussion, you know, recently with the city council, at least preliminary discussion, with council sort of laying out the procedural options for how to fill uh, uh, Lucas Farrick's seat, Mayor Farrick's seat, when when that becomes vacant in January, early January. Of course, the seat doesn't become vacant until he uh, takes office at the at Yolo County. Um, and so we've had some discussion with council laying out some of those options um, and uh, preparing for some early January decisions, you know, by the, by the remaining council members, um, uh, for how to, what process they'd like to utilize to go about, um, filling that seat. So, um, you know, other than that, it's, we're sort of plugging away in terms of, uh, also speaking of sort of the return of some things we have, the uh, a number of events around town, including the, uh, Thursdays in the Davis Fear, for example, is uh, launched. Um, I think they, they had a good successful launch uh, at Central Park Thursday Thursday evenings. Um, that's gone quite well. We, we're gearing up for sort of a hybrid version of the Nutcracker production uh, this year. So, you know, again, just along this theme of this sort of you know, gradual return of uh, some of our traditions locally. So I'll leave it at that for now, but happy to answer any questions or elaborate on anything. Great, thank you for, for the update, Mike. Um, yeah, and it's been nice, you know, I think there's that, that sense of 
normalcy starting to kind of come back into our lives and driving to work and seeing, you know, the vast number of kids on bikes and getting to school and crossing guards and, you know, like obviously we're back in last year in the very beginning, but it's a different feeling this year and with the students coming back into town um, this week as well. Um, having both those combined this week has, has been, at least for me, it's been a, um, you know, kind of this return to our community getting back and being active and being together again. So it's definitely been great to um, to see that move forward. So um, thank you for all your work in, in getting our schools open and, and back back in swing this school year. Um, all right, so moving along, item five, discussion items. Um, 5A is return to campus update. So I would kick that over to you, Matt. Yeah, thanks, Josh. So um, I, I think you, you said it best and it's really nice to see uh, school reopening in a more normal fashion this year. Uh, it's nice to see students and staff smiling faces. All of our staff across the district have noted the significant difference uh, in their experience, both for students and staff upon the return this year. We continue to face like nearly every industry in uh, the United States, uh, staffing shortages, uh, particularly in the paraeducator realm, um, and as well as uh, some key classified physicians, custodians, grounds crew, um, uh, student nutrition services staff. So if you know folks that are interested in working with students, uh, we would appreciate their applications. We've got many part-time, full-time jobs open and uh, are currently in negotiations with our classified union in particular to uh, bring up some of those uh, wages. Uh, we are kicking off uh, a strategic plan this fall with uh, Performance Fact, who will be our uh, strategic plan process facilitators. Um, and that will be kicking off in October. You should see some messaging coming out here in the next week or so regarding an opportunity to join what we're calling the core planning team, which uh, can involve as many people as would like to be involved. And they will help to uh, set the strategic vision and priorities for our district. I'll be reaching out to uh, some of our city partners to join what we're calling the alignment team. Uh, which is a broad range of uh, stakeholders from around uh, town uh, who uh, will help to make sure that the work of that core planning team uh, really fits with, within the uh, broader vision of our community. And we're looking to have our strategic plan done uh, around May or June. Uh, and that will really help us to set the, set the vision for the future. We, we know through the pandemic, uh, life has changed. Uh, for uh, not only our industry, but many industries uh, around the country. And we think this is the right opportunity to take a big step back, refocus on students and instruction, and really chart, chart the path forward. Um, as sort of subsets of that strategic plan, we've got two other big things happening. Uh, last spring, we commissioned a report from WestEd, which is a, a nationwide uh, research organization to do a comprehensive study of our special education programming. And uh, that report is nearly complete and we expect it to be published next week um, as a draft for our community to provide feedback on. Uh, there'll be a board presentation on October 6th. Um, and I think, you know, my, my personal feeling is that we do our best work in Davis when um, uh, everything we've got is out on the table and really having a, a, a thoughtful dialogue about the hard stuff. Um, and we haven't talked about special education programming in our town uh, really, uh, publicly ever, I don't think, not substantively anyway. And so I think this is going to be a great opportunity for us to think about what we want uh, for our future programming and really chart a course uh, forward. And then the other big one is we are, uh, as you will hear a little bit later from uh, Alan, we are nearing completion of, of the $150 million in Measure M bond program projects. Um, we have about another $75 million in funding coming in over the next uh, five to six years and uh, through other funding sources. And uh, we are looking to start to gather input about our previously identified uh, facilities priorities and whether there are things uh, like the expansion of uh, all day TK and kinder uh, facilities and um, what things we should be doing first uh, with those funds as they come in. So that uh, will also kick off here uh, within the next couple of months with uh, outreach to our community. So we've got a lot happening this fall, uh, sort of organizationally, um, uh, and we're still doing all of the, uh, the educating and social events. Um, I mentioned homecomings this week, uh, Friday night, 
at Davis Senior High School, got a homecoming dance on Friday, uh, Saturday night, actually, um, and then the parade uh, Friday at 1.30. So it's really nice to have those culture building, community building activities again, just like in the city. It's great to have them throughout the district as well. Um, we are doing something new this year as a staff. We are having a family picnic um, here in a couple of weeks. And so looking forward to have our, our school, extended school community together to, um, uh, to join together in fellowship and some food. So I think that is about all I've got to say. Uh, and I don't know if Tom or Joe, if you have anything you want to add uh, as well. Um, I'll, I'll go. Uh, thank you for that, Matt. Uh, really appreciate it. And we are thrilled to be back in session. And uh, I'm looking forward to the homecoming parade. I hope our colleagues on the council will join us uh, for, for that and for the event. Um, I also want to point out uh, that uh, this is banned book week. Uh, and uh, we have, I think, at the district done a fantastic job, our librarians and our teachers in supporting access to books, age appropriate books for all of our students. I think it's an important part of our community that we value access to knowledge uh, and diverse points of view. Uh, and I appreciate the support of the school district and frankly, all of our community little libraries, many of which are uh, celebrating Band Book Week by, um, by installing Band Books in the little libraries all throughout town, including the one in front of our house. And you all are welcome to come by and pick up a Band Book. Um, but I really appreciate that we are in a place now where I, I dare not use the word uh, 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 city manager where I've mentioned, and I, I'm with him on trepidation to call it normal, but uh, it does feel like many of the touchstones that we've had as a community being back in person are happening and those just feel, they feel fantastic. And I just want to add, uh, first of all, uh, thank you for that update, Matt. And, and Mike, thank you for your, that update. Um, uh, just, it's incredible to me that uh, so much of uh, the emphasis today is on uh, student leadership. And so uh, I just, uh, last weekend, I worked with the California Association of Student Council in Region 2. They have their uh, conference, student conference, uh, good issues coming out of there. But uh, if I could get more information about that SACOG uh, Youth Leadership Conference, I'd love to send it out to my uh, students who are part of uh, CASC and share it with them, as well as the DJUSD students, uh, I think it would be great. Yeah, absolutely. I'll send that over to you, Tom. All right. Thank you. Yeah, of course. All right. Um, thank you for that, Matt. Just a quick question for you. When, how often does this, um, is, does the strategic plan happen? Is that uh, every couple of years or when was the last time one was done? I'm just out of curiosity. The last time we did a strategic plan was 2016. Oh, okay. And I would say uh, it's sort of uh, waned in the, the, the later years of 1920. Um, and I think our last plan, just speaking bluntly, was was very tactical. Um, it was addressing some of those uh, threats and opportunities that were existing uh, organizationally. And I think with this strategic plan, we'll have a little different form and function to it, really trying to focus on what do we want as outcomes for students um, at the center? Uh, what sort of instructional practices and structures do we need to make that happen? And then the sort of empowering infrastructure um, as the sort of next ring of that circle, so to speak. Um, so I think, you know, we, we need to make sure we don't drift too far from that center, right? That we're, we're, <laughs> we're here to serve students and it's easy to get caught up. You know, we're, we're gonna be talking about enrollment today, like that, it's easy to drift away from that core, uh, core mission. Uh, and it's really important that we're balancing all of those other forces as well. So I think the strategic plan really helps us to do that. And it also helps us to get a beat on where our, broader community is, what they're thinking about and uh, what they're passionate about, what changes they hope to see in our system. So I think it's a good, a good way for us to continue to, um, you know, keep connected with our larger uh, community and partners. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's great. I look forward to, to being engaged with that as well. And I know, you know,
of seems in this world that we're living in now, there's a lot more engagement from, from our community as a whole and communities across other regions as well. But I think it, it's great to see that um, roll out. Does anything that, that I can do or we can do to, you know, to help facilitate that and get the word out? I'm, I'm more than happy to do that. Um, all right, so moving along, we'll go to 5B COVID-19 updates. Um, we have uh, the city listed first, so we'll kick that over to Mike. Yeah, thanks very much, uh, Council Member, uh, Councilman Chapman. Um, yeah, I mean, we touched on some things briefly, but you know, we're, you know, again, sort of in this constant monitoring and assessing mode. You know, um, understanding where the county and the county health officer, you know, current uh, standing is with respect to guidance. Um, so we are continually, continually, continually. I can say the word, um, monitoring that, you know, going, I think currently we're in the yellow um, category of, of sort of risk, if you will, um, and in our facilities. So, you know, masking is still, you know, strongly uh, encouraged, recommended, um, but short of mandated. Um, we do have our council meetings back to in-person uh, for a few months now, um, and those seem to be going, going well. Um, Fairly lightly attended uh, with in person, um, you know, overall, but you know, definitely more of a comeback to uh, to in person. But we do have the hybrid format where uh, we do have uh, the voicemail system for for comments as well. All of our other commissions uh, remain in a Zoom format, um, and basically, what our position on that is that we're we're basically tracking. The state legislation on Brown Act, um, and you know uh, what's happening around that, and what the rules are going to look like. You know what the governor is going to end up signing uh, or not, and um, so we're we're tracking that carefully so that we can, when we when it is time to make adjustments, you know, in a perfect world, we'd like to make the adjustments one time and not have to do it multiple times, um, and sort of have the yo-yo effect of going into Zoom and out of Zoom and into Zoom and so forth. So um, I think as we get closer to um, uh, the end of the month or into next month, we'll, we'll know a little bit more about where, where all that's headed and when. Um, uh, in the meantime, the Healthy Davis Together program, uh, I think had a, uh, for all intents and purposes, a, a successful wind down um, where we transitioned, I think the testing platform uh, over to uh, just more reliance on self-testing, self-testing uh, kits. Uh, we've made a big push to get test kits out into the more vulnerable populations uh, of the community, as has Yolo County, um, and uh, including uh, the county putting uh, uh, vending machines uh, in various locations in the county to help dispense test kits. Uh, the city also acquired, uh, in conjunction with the university, uh, acquired a fairly significant number of test kits that we could distribute to affordable housing locations, respite center, um, you know, any number of care providers, uh, community-based organizations to help uh, get those distributed and into, into the right hands. Um, and um, so, you know, in the meantime, we are also in the throes of um, uh, implementing and dispersing uh, ARP funds uh, that the uh, that we receive from the federal government. Uh, in our case, uh, close to about $20 million uh, of those funds. Uh, there's a little bit of reserve that the council had set aside that hasn't been decided just yet how that will be used, but we're going to be coming back to the council with an overall ARP fund update um, in October. And, um, you know, providing an update on our implementation of the ARP funds that have been assigned or decisions have been made on and then probably engaging with the council in terms of what process they might like to see for uh, decisions on how to utilize the, the remaining uh, reserve funds. Because the, as we all know, I think the, the clock is ticking on the time frame where we have to use those funds. Uh, so they, they can't go on indefinitely. Um, so I'd say those are you know, primary updates. I'll look to you know, my, my city colleagues with uh, Kelly and, uh, Vice Mayor Arnold and Councilmember Chapman to see if they have any other highlights that I may have missed. All right. Oh, I, 
I will note uh, one thing I did neglect to note is the um, uh, the wastewater uh, effluent testing. Um, so that has that is one element of Healthy Davis together that is, uh, was planned to continue uh, through the end of this calendar year, and that is so that is still progressing. Um, albeit it's at a fairly high level of testing now. It's not at sort of the uh, it's going to be transitioning to not be at the sort of neighborhood level. Um, uh, discrete level that it was before, uh, but it will still be happening, and that will still be, especially as more people, you know, are, are doing self testing. Uh, we rely more and more heavily upon uh, things like wastewater testing to be our indicator of uh, trends. So, all right, thank you, Mike. Well, that's uh, as Will knows, it's the second time in 24 hours we've had the uh, talk about affluent in, uh, in our council meeting and then here again here tonight, which uh, it's my first for me. Um, Will or Kelly, do you have anything to add? No, I don't think so. I think that was pretty comprehensive. Thank you so much, Mike. All right. Thank you. All right. We will now um, move it over to, uh, to Matt. Yeah, thanks. Uh, we, we have been appreciating not having to change our policies and practices every uh, two to four weeks. It's been nice to have uh, consistent expectations from our state and uh, uh, the feds and our local health official and have, and to have those all be aligned, which is uh, quite, really a nice uh, shift for us. Uh, as Mike mentioned, we're, we've moved to mass recommended indoors for at-risk populations. Um, there was a shift from uh, Cal OSHA and uh, the state that unvaccinated staff and volunteers uh, are not required to test uh, every other week. That was just dropped last week. So that's been a nice uh, shifting of expectations as well. Um, we are still having about one to three cases a day, I would say uh, on average, um, and still have uh, test kits available for families in all of our school offices. And we have a, a good supply that should last us uh, for the remainder of the year at the current, um, the current rate. So I think that's about all I have. And anything else in you? trustees or staff want to add, feel free to jump in. Uh, I don't have anything to add. Thanks, Matt. Um, Matt, just one thing, and I apologize. Uh, I don't recall the date, but that we are doing um, sort of just peripherally related to COVID-19, um, a uh, flu vaccine, a drive through flu vaccine, uh, I believe in October. Is that correct? I think that is right, too. I'll get those dates uh, together get those out there's a fair number of them around the area flu it's the it's the both arm drive through flu and uh the bivalent vaccine all right great thank you matt all right thank you for that update matt um we are now uh 5c facility and construction projects it's got a uh, you listed again first matt so we'll keep rolling with them um, with you and your team on this one yeah, sure. Well, I'm uh, happy to introduce Alan Contreras, who is also known as David Burke on Zoom. Uh, Alan's our uh, project manager and uh, Dave's right-hand man as uh, we blast our way through construction around the district. And Alan, I'll let you sort of give an update and jump in as needed. Okay, well, great. Thanks for having me. Um, appreciate it. Uh, our four MPRs, Birch Lane, uh, Willett, North Davis, and Chavez are uh, pretty much wrapping up. We're just doing some punch item lists and a couple of uh, small items here and there. We also had a, a big project at the Da Vinci High School for the Tech Hub, which um, that one is also wrapping up. We do have our ribbon cutting for uh, Chavez on tomorrow from 3.30 to 5, and then at North next Thursday from 3 to 4.30 with um, Willett and uh, the Tech Hub to be determined. Um, <clears throat> over at the high school, we have a few CTE projects. We have a um, agricultural project, a transportation and an engineering project that we have going. Uh, we're starting to kick off with our STEM building. Um, and part of the STEM building is also the construction of three new uh, tennis courts to the north. Um, following the STEM building completion, we'll be rolling into um, our aquatics portion uh, center. So that's just a quick rundown. And I'm here for uh, any questions if you guys have any. 
All right, thank you for that. Um, anybody have any will or anyone from the city side have any follow up questions or comments? I had a quick one. Thank you very much for the overview. You'd mentioned the, uh, a, a couple of projects, a transportation and an ag project, I think at the high school, you said? Yeah, we have three uh, CTE projects currently going at the high school. One is agriculture, which is involves a little renovation to the uh, greenhouse, renovations to the barn area, some um, planters, raised planters and such, a little bit. Got of it. Okay. And we have transportation, which is a new EV bay, new uh, bay for electric vehicles with a couple of lifts in there, uh, an overhang and the, some other flat work. And then we have a, a brand new engineering building that we're putting on the corner of 14th and Oak, which is for robotics, um, along with some um, other items in, in there. Um, right. Going on right now at the high school. And just okay. as a little bit of editorial comment, Mike, those are from uh, uh, our career technical education uh, pathway. Um, and we were uh, very fortunate in, in our timing in that we um, had the bond funds available and we applied for, uh, for actually four CTE grants um, for a total of $9 million. Uh, one is at Da Vinci High School in the Tech Hub, which has got a really cool digital fabrication lab and coding uh, and coding lab. And then uh, at Davis High, the three projects that uh, Alan mentioned, um, really a nice addition to the, uh, the existing projects that we had planned. Nice, thank, thank you very Matt, much. This is Joe, if I, I could, if I, Mike, if I could also add, I think it is really, uh, you know, uh, we're so uh, pleased with the uh, district's effort, district staff's effort in, uh, bringing these projects all to completion uh, successfully on time and on budget. And particularly for the CTE project, um, you, you may know that we went through a substantial curriculum revision with a real emphasis on CTE being accessible to all of our students. And these new facilities are gonna really help support that. Uh, and so we're, we're thrilled that we're in process and we look forward to them, uh, them being completed. And while we're giving kudos, I just want to thank the board for their vision in, uh, do, in you know, kicking off a facilities master plan, which uh, initiated a bond, and then they're really their foresight uh, to sell all of those bonds uh, at a really opportune time in the market, saving Davis taxpayers nearly $80 million in interest over the duration of that bond from what was projected at the beginning, um, and really pushing us as staff to supercharge uh, the, the construction of these projects in a way that would allow us to do them on time and on budget um, has been, you know, that, that takes leadership at the governance level and it's much appreciated. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for that. And it's been great. My, um, my sixth grader did the, um, the Circuit City Robotics Camp that was held at uh, Birch Lane this summer. So it was my the first and only time I was able to get into one of those new facilities and they're just beautiful in the way that it fits into that campus. It's not this huge monstrosity, you know, tucked over the side. It's it just the relationship with how it interacts with the current setting and with the school. I think it, it, they look great. And um, those projects have, have moved forward and they're going to be a great asset to, to the community as a whole. Obviously, the schools, but the community as a whole as well. So it's exciting to see all those get online. And I look forward to checking the one out at Da Vinci and, and seeing um, you know, these facilities get used and how they're really put to use within our community. So thank you all for your, for your work in making that happen and your continued efforts to make those a success. And one other thing I will mention, Josh, before we move on is that we constructed all of our new buildings, uh, especially those NPRs and the Tech Hub at Da Vinci to be independent of the grid. So if there happens to be a power outage, yeah. uh, we have a generator on a trailer that we can plug in and use those buildings as emergency shelters uh, should the need arise in our great. community. Oh, wow. That's great. And if I could just make a suggestion that a future uh, two by two meeting actually occur at Da Vinci and the new facilities there, I think it'd be real exciting. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you for that, Matt. And we'll move it over to, um, to Mike and the city team for uh, facility and construction projects on the city side. 
Yeah, thanks very much, uh, Councilmember Chapman. So uh, Diana Jensen, uh, our city engineer and um, acting director for Public Works um, Engineering and Transportation is with us uh, this evening and uh, she can give a brief overview and primarily focused on those projects that are sort of, I, I think have more of a relationship to school district facilities and sites and so forth. So Diana, let me turn it over to you. Thank you, Mike. Um, and I will share my screen. I just made a list really quickly of the projects that I, I thought were, you know, nearby or maybe in the path of students um, going to different schools. So I just arranged them in um, categories of what's currently in construction. We are doing uh, an electrical um, changeover at Community Pool. And I know that I heard from our uh, contract inspection group today that they did get a chance to talk to David Burke about what's going on there and their possibly overlap of the work that's going on at the Davis High School campus. So we are um, coordinating and talking about that. And then we are also doing the Veterans Memorial Center siting, replacing the siting. That project is going on right now. And then um, we have our 2122 slurry seal project and I'll show you a map of where those locations are. Um, they're kind of all over the city so I just thought it'd be quick to share that map so I'll get to that in a minute. Under design right now and soon to bid is our pavement rehab project. Again I have a map showing you those locations. We are close to um, requesting our grant funds for the H Street project which includes more of the uh, H Street towards Davis Little League and the tunnel that goes underneath the railroad tracks. So we're pretty excited about finally getting that one kicked off. We're hoping to um, get the authorization for funding and put it out to bid and the construction won't start until June of next year. And then we're also working on a city facility roofing um, the name of the entire project is a, includes HVAC. The three or four roofs that we're doing this first time don't include that. The one that I'm highlighting is, um, it's actually, sorry, the VMT roof, the theater, not the center. And just highlighting that because it is um, near Davis Elementary and Davis High School. <coughs> Excuse me. Projects that are in design, but we don't have a bid date identified yet. We have a bike pump track that is at Community Park. Again, not too far from DHS and North Davis Elementary. We are working on our Mace Boulevard corridor redesign. We're calling it phase two. It will affect the um, students who are making their way over to Valley Oak. We're in uh, design with that right now, probably bid either late winter, early spring for a uh, uh, spring summer construction. And then we have 14th Street and Villanova Drive improvements. This is the one that we are going to be redoing uh, the road on 14th Street in front of the high school and North Davis Elementary and redoing the striping. We actually just asked SACOG to let us extend our funding for that. We were supposed to be in construction in next summer but with all of the um, projects going on in the area right now, and also with our new traffic engineer, Ryan Chapman, he um, has been looking at the design, looking at the results of the pilot test that was done there. And we are probably going to be doing another community meeting to, um, to talk again about the design options. So we're slowing down that project a little bit for multiple reasons. Yeah, on that one, just if I may interject just very briefly, Diana, on that point, I know that one of the real sort of points of, of you know, concern and attention um, was the idea of a, the uh, cycle track uh, along that stretch, particularly as it go the stretch in front of the high school, the elementary school, the library, uh, and all those uh, driveway interfaces that that occur along that stretch. And that's something that our, our new traffic engineer, Ryan Chapman, as Diana noted, has been taking a really hard look at. Um, and uh, I expect that to be a key area where we're gonna have some, some uh, different suggestions and recommendations coming forward. Of course, the school district is a, a huge and key stakeholder in all that process. And you know we'll be engaged in uh, with the district uh, team um, 
uh, on that as well. Thanks, Mike. And thank you. Yeah. Um, our Anderson Road improvements, we have, uh, again, a grant from SACOG to, to uh, modify some of the uh, drop-off, the parent drop-off and the parking lot. Uh, there's also work being done by the school district, you know, at that parking lot. So we're trying to coordinate and use the same design team. SACOG actually pushed out our funding allotment for that until 25, 26, I believe. So we are moving forward with design with local funds and working closely with SACOG to be able to request the um, funding as soon as the design is ready so that we don't slow it down more than necessary. So more to come on that. We haven't actually um, kicked off the full design of that project yet. So it's still a couple of years out. Um, I just threw Richard's I-80 in here because it's a big project, it, you know, it affects everyone in town. <laughs> and so um, that one is going to change the off ramp from I-80 onto Richard's and actually the entire intersection, how people get onto 80. And so we are hoping for that one to be out to bid late spring next year with a summer construction. And that will be, um, you know, just like I said, affecting as people as they get off 80 and try to uh, cross through to downtown and to South Davis in that area. Uh, we have Electrify Yellow project, which is just establishing some uh, electric uh, vehicle charging locations in town. Um, I don't have a map showing those locations. If you're interested, I can certainly get that and um, provide that to, to Kelly to distribute. I think our schedule for that is to be in construction with that one um, next year as well, 2023. And just some ones that we're just studying right now, we are studying the intersection of Pole Line Road with this street intersections and how the traffic um, flows through there. And then also the Fifth Street corridor from L Street to Pole Line. We did restrike that. And as many of you know, who um, work at the district offices there it, in kind of a pilot project, it's uh, done in paint, not in thermo. And um, we're just studying how that's working and what to recommend moving forward for, for permanent. So what I'll do right now is just share the, the maps. And Diana, I would just mention for anyone who's watching or didn't know, I think the Mace Boulevard piece would affect the, my assumptions you meant Pioneer, not Valley Oak, right? Oh, I'm sorry, Pioneer, yes. Right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Get all my schools messed up. Yeah. We can, sh we can share these maps. I, I'm sure we can share these yes. maps. And uh, in, in, in I know that Barbara and so forth have, you know, are, have and will be in communication at the staff level, but we're happy to share these out um, with you after the meeting too. So these are just the streets that were um, in construction right now during the slurry, slurry seal. Some of these have already been done. Some are coming up in the next couple of weeks. So yeah, we can share those maps. And then the, the full rehab streets, um, here's the streets that we're gonna be doing. We're hoping to be putting this out to bid probably in November for um, a early spring start. So those are the areas that we're going to be redoing. And that's all I had. Diane, I think we'd love to connect with you about um, your electrification, your charging station program. We're thinking about that for some of our uh, parking lots as well here. Uh, okay. Maybe maybe some alignment, you know, if we're using the same systems or that, you know, might be worth, worth a discussion. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and um, um, this is Joe Mask. Uh, 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 just a question, a follow up on the Anderson corridor. Is there, um, from SACOG's perspective, is there a reason why they wanted uh, that project to be delayed till 25, 26? Are there other sort of contingent um, projects or efforts going on from a transportation standpoint? Um, what was the sort of uh, underlying uh, driver of, of slowing that down? You know, they, they didn't really have a very clear explanation for why that particular project got pushed out in the funding years. Um, even after they made that communication to us, I they reached out like three or four months later and said, 
you know, all of a sudden we have more funding because of another project that um, wasn't able to apply for their authorization. So any project that's fully designed and shelf ready, we have, I don't even, I think it was like $15 million. It was a huge amount of money. If we'd been ready to go, we could have applied for funding right then. So, I, you know, it's just, it's, it's kind of a moving target with SACOG. So I, I think our plan right now, which is to move forward with design and get it, get it shelf ready, get it fully designed and ready to go. I, I really strongly believe we'll be able to um, ask for the funding earlier. Great, thank, thank you for that update. And I'm sure you know, but obviously that would be, uh, being able to do it sooner rather than later would be a great benefit to the community. I think not just um, our families that uh, are attending Cesar Chavez, but just the whole community that uses that corridor as anybody who's been there during drop off and even in pickup, it's a, it's a little bit of a challenge to navigate. So I appreciate you uh, staying focused on it. Thank you. Absolutely. And this is Tom Adams here, just on the MACE uh, improvements in South Davis, just uh, because of the sensitivity of that issue work. I think I can speak for Matt that um, any information you want us to get out in terms of our own parent networks and get people informed of things happening ahead of time where we'd be happy to get, get that out there. Uh, redundancy is gonna be our, re our friend in this case. Absolutely, thank you. Yeah, I appreciate that very much, thank you. Just be careful that you're, you're volunteering yourself into the Mace Boulevard conversation here, Tom. So just, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and you too, Joe, he's volunteering you as well. So you guys are ready to go. I, 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 I think that's a forward button on the email. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Our city, our city partners are our brothers and sisters. We are glad to be, uh, be part of the conversation. We appreciate that. Um, all right. Any other from Matt? Do you have something you want to jump in for the um, facility construction projects for Mike or Diana? No, nothing for me. Nope. Okay. All right. Um, We'll move along to 5D enrollment. I'll pass it over to you, Matt. Yeah, thanks. So um, uh, I wanted to sort of give an update now that we're we're up and running this year to give you some uh, some updates about uh, how our enrollment is forecasted and also what enrollment is currently. Um, and this, of course, has an impact uh, primarily on our budget, uh, but also the structures of our organization, school size, programming, um, all of those things are sort of tied up uh, with enrollment because the vast majority of our funding comes from the state and it is tied to two factors. One is enrollment and how frequently those students attend, which is a challenging reality uh, for school districts across the state because we have fixed costs regardless of how frequently uh, students attend or not. And uh, so we, we are continually uh, uh, working, fighting that battle. Um, I'm going to share my screen here real quick to give you some, some slides. So one of the primary ways we uh, project enrollment is around birth rates. So you've probably been hearing this uh, story around California that birth rates are on the decline. Uh, that is definitely the case uh, in Davis. You can see there in the 2001 school year, uh, that is on the far left. In the year 2001, there were 637 births. Um, and that translates to kindergarten enrollment in 2006, right? So those kids are uh, uh, enter school about five years later. So over here on the far right, those are births in 2020, and those students will be entering our school system in 2025. So that's one big predictor about uh, the size of our district, um, you know, based on the number of students being born and residing in Davis. This is the other uh, big factor is around mobility. This is students moving into or out of uh, Davis Joint Unified. The red, so you can see the schools over there on the left and we do it by attendance areas at the elementary level because those span uh, the entire district. Uh, so for example, you know, Holmes uh, is sort of in the North Davis and Birch Lane attendance zone. Um, but you can see on there, you know, this is kids progressing from one grade to another. You can see a lot of red boxes in there. And essentially what those red bo boxes mean is that in that attendance area, in that grade, 
more students left the district than joined. The green boxes uh, represent um, positive mobility, right? Students moved in to our schools, uh, into those schools, uh, in those grade bands. So you can see a lot more green boxes um, in kinder and first grade uh, and first to second. And then you see a lot, you see more green boxes in the, um, uh, in the upper grades as well. So, and just sort of to give you some historical perspective um, down here uh, on this slide, this is from 2013, 14, up until the 1920 school year. And you can see where there's blue, a lot more blue and green um, up until 2018. And we're starting to see a precipitous drop in enrollment uh, throughout the district. And that is why we see these district-wide enrollment projections, you know, back in the 2005 uh, era. And I'll talk about why that, why we started with that particular year. We were in that 8,500 range, bumped up here to 8,600 in 2006. Um, and last year, we were right around 8,300. And I'll talk about where we are here currently in just a minute. And we're projected to um, continue to decline slightly um, over the next five years. And one of the reasons why you're not seeing a more precipitous decline is non-resident students. Uh, so over here, this is the this bottom slide where it says out of district students. Um, uh, you can see that number is growing over time. So over here on the right is 2005. So there's about 200 non-resident students in Davis Joint Unified in 2005. And uh, currently there's around 1100. And that change is corresponding to a decline of resident students over that same window of time. So right now, I'm going to stop my screen sharing here, and I'm going to go to a different chart. So today, there are 8,419 students, of which 11, roughly 1,100 are, uh, don't reside in Davis. And so our district population of residents. Uh, could, could you make the numbers a little bit bigger? Oh, yes, of course. Thanks. Uh, maybe not that big. There we go. Is that better? So um, the story here is that uh, out of these 8,419 students, around 1,100 of them don't reside in Davis. So our Davis resident population is about 7,300. So this district would look fundamentally different than it does today with 1,100 fewer students. So really, this, we, we are filling the seats on a plane that have been vacated by resident students uh, with non-resident students. And most of those are students who are what we call residents by employment. They are city students of city employees, district employees, university employees um, who work here in time more than 20 hours a week and um, you know their kids can uh, join our schools if there is um, if there is an, if there is space. The other most significant change that we are going to see here over the next uh, several years with regards to our enrollment is the addition of universal TK transitional kindergarten. So essentially, for all of us, when we went to school, uh, there were thirteen grades from kindergarten through grade twelve, and now there is essentially a fourteenth grade uh, kindergarten transitional kindergarten over the next couple of years will be available to all four-year-olds. And there's a couple of reasons for that. One, uh, research shows that the sooner students enter school and are um, getting that social interaction, learning how to read, um, they perform better uh, in life and school over the course of their, uh, their time. And then the second big reason is that in California, the, the entire state is declining in enrollment. And in order to keep neighborhood schools open, to keep districts solvent, uh, this, is a, this is a method to stave off uh, uh, significant declining enrollment in the early grades. And you can kind of see in our numbers here, you know, we've only got 100 kids in TK now, that number we expect to rise. Um, but when you look at for, uh, first grade here, for example, uh, you know, you can see that that number is significantly different than our 12th graders, right? And when we look at our seven through nine cohort, the average is around 700 students. When we look at our first through sixth grade cohort, the average is 590 students. So this trend line is going to continue with lower grade level cohorts moving forward into our secondary schools. And we are anticipating a decrease in the size of our junior highs 
uh, and Davis Senior High School uh, and our and Da Vinci Charter Academy here over the next several years. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there is an, there is some positive mobility in our upper grades uh, because students join at Da Vinci Charter Academy from uh, outside the district. They join Davis High School uh, for high school years. So we are always, I think, going to see some bit of higher enrollment there. Uh, but the fundamental story here is that we're not seeing uh, elementary cohorts of 600 and 650 like we did uh, 10 years ago. And we're seeing uh, a decline, right? Remember that number 2005 was around 8,500, 8,600. We are, the number of non-resident students can't keep up with the decline of resident students. Um, and so I think that's really an important thing for us to be thinking about as a community. This has implications on housing, um, on our future planning uh, 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 within the city, and certainly that those have an impact on uh, the district, our ability to offer excellent programs, neighborhood schools, um, and uh, schools where students can walk or bike uh, easily. So I think with that, I'm going to stop talking and uh, maybe let our trustees uh, say anything if they would like to and, uh, and open up for questions. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, Tom or Joe? Yeah, I'll just add, uh, Matt, that was great. Thank you for that um, description. You know, I would just add that this is, while not the sole impetus for our strategic planning effort, of course, it certainly is a big part of thinking about the next five plus years as part of our uh, strategic planning process. So, you know, for those that might be interested in talking about our mission and our vision and some of the sort of core driving elements, we'd love to have you involved in the process. But those that also want to think about, hey, how are we going to make sure that we have the right size district or have the right resources placed in a way that maintains fiscal sustainability, but also, you know, maximizes our ability to have impact on individuals and neighborhoods, we would love to have you participate in the strategic planning process. And let me add and, one other important yeah. detail, Tom, before you jump in, and that is we're seeing an interesting phenomenon uh, over this past uh, six or seven months uh, in that the, the largest growth we're seeing of resident students is coming through the apartment complexes that were essentially designed as student housing. Uh, which is a which is an interesting phenomenon, and I think that we've got families moving into the uh, low income uh, availability and uh, and bringing with them multiple students, uh, which is a phenomenon that we didn't necessarily expect, uh, but the, it's been a nice uh, addition. But that's where most of our positive uh, student growth of resident students is coming from in the last uh, six or eight months, and not from you know home, home turnover. Uh, that you usually see over the summer so yeah thanks for bringing that up matt um i just want to say also to our city uh, colleagues is that it's not just a question of keeping the school district going you know or filling all the plane all the seats on the plane but it's also a sense of we need to give the young people who we develop and educate uh, make sure that not only that they can have maybe live here in Davis, but also have a job here in Davis. Uh, I think that's one of the, the big questions in front of our community is, you know, we educate all these very um, bright young people who want to improve things and we should find a place for them to live and work here. Uh, we're losing, we're getting a brain drain from Davis and I, I think we should do something to make sure that they can have a future here. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Um, Will or anyone from the city side, any questions or comments? Uh, uh, I'll, I'll chime in if I can. Um, I think we all knew that that was the case, but it's always very stark when we see it. Um, and I'm very interested and um and both observing but also participating in whatever way the district uh, would see helpful from the city side in this long-range planning process um this is one of the somewhat rare um items that uh acutely affects the district um but that the solutions of it are outside of the purview of the district to some degree to a large degree 
Um, and, and for that reason, I think, uh, I mean, I would personally love to, um, to receive that presentation at a public city council meeting. This is a public meeting, but obviously we don't get as many eyeballs uh, or even just my council colleagues seeing sort of the state of things um, bec and, and hearing what, what was just shared with us about the types of housing that you're seeing um, uh, a lots of uh, school age children living uh, really uh, paints a picture that I think a lot of community members maybe don't understand uh, uh, is is happening and and happening sort of with some immediacy. So um, I don't know how helpful that would be during your long range planning process to sort of pick at it a little bit with the community. Um, but at, you know, as we move forward with a plan, and if we're trying to sell the community on the plan. Um, I think the city can be um, uh, a good, a, a, an important partner at that point because there's some solutions that are going to be city type solutions that we need to be <laughs> looking at in terms, of, uh, in terms of the type of uh, um, housing that we provide to uh, potential parents or students as one example. And I'm certainly happy to come to give that presentation or, or one more detailed or less detailed and uh, you know Mike you certainly just let me know when you'd like me to come and and I'll be there an opportunity for the uh, for uh, I and my colleagues to ask questions in a public setting uh, about this information I think would be helpful to the ultimate you know whatever the ultimate goals end up being how to address it Thank yeah, you. and Matt if I could just add one thing to, to Will's comments and Will we would welcome uh, participation from uh, members of city staff and the city council in this process. I think your voices, both as you know, as members of our community, but also in your, you know, your your role as an elected official, I think it'd be fantastic to to kind of find the right path for you to to engage. So we'd really be grateful for that. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm definitely supportive of that. Well, I think you hit the nail on the head with it. It's a few times where these where it's you know, both of us are, you know, moving something for that, you know, the, the, it's not in the control, but, you know, definitely policies and decisions that we're moving forward and issues around housing are so important to enrollment as we see here. And I think it's definitely, I would be completely um, supportive of having this come forward and, and have us have this presentation and be able to have this dialogue conversation and bring this forward to the community. Because I think, you know, in a lot of times in, in our lives and everyone else's lives, it's so busy and, and it's uh, the connection is oftentimes lost, I think, and especially in land use decisions, um, they're also, you know, get really heated. So I think it's important to, to draw some other um, conclusions in and connections to how this can benefit our community as a whole. So I think it'd be great to, to have this um, before all of us. Um, anybody and else? I, yeah, I just want to add that. Um, I'm just hoping uh, to that this presentation will change the question that com the community usually puts forward on, on housing development and economic development, that they understand the greater context, not just how it'll affect you know, uh, things tomorrow, but in the future. And I think that's, I think we gotta, as a community, start looking down the road, not just, you know, what's, what's what's the rock in the road right now, but how we build a better road in the future. Yes, thank you, Tom, and that's a great point. Um, all right, anybody else here um, on 5D enrollment? Uh, seeing none, we're gonna open it up to public comment. So if you're on the phone, press uh, star nine, or if you're here um, on the Zoom, you can hit the raise, raise hand button and we'll go from there. Are you seeing any public comment, Kelly? So yes, I see two hands. Commissioner okay. Gavin, you're first. If you'll unmute yourself, you've got three minutes for public comment. Yes, it was a very interesting presentation on um, enrollment and I would like to have a copy of that if possible. My um, comment is in terms of housing, um, in, in, in addition to a low income housing, I think it would be a good thing to look at um, mixed incomes. And that has worked very well with the city of Roseville. And also, um, I think 
this is a unique opportunity with small enrollment for the district schools to really focus in on, on what it is that they, the different curriculums and the programs that they offer. Because as a parent, um, parents who are concerned always look for really good schools. And you have a university that has a law school, it has a medical program. And this is a part of some of the students' decision where they're going to attend um, graduate school, professional school. Um, I know in uh, UCLA, they have a public school on the campus for the uh, university students, you know, for the faculty members. And it's, it's private, it's, it's an elite school, but if you know about it, because it's on public property, your kids can attend. And in Berkeley, from K through eight, they have a lot of private schools which I was surprised to see. But the kids really, the community really goes to the public high school in Berkeley. It is truly with their programs and everything. It's one of the best schools in the state, which I found interesting in terms of uh, the K through eight was um, private, but everyone goes to, to the public high school because that's just how good it is. So it's a unique time to uh, to evaluate what it is that the schools do best and to really hone in on that, but also um, people who are concerned about their children's future want their kids in the best school. And that was always a major decision where I lived with my children who are all college graduates. Thank you. Thank you to the public commenter. And Matt, is this is the document that the commenter was referring to? Is that something they can access? It is. It's on our um, board report, uh, and I'm. It's uh, if I don't I don't see a chat, but it is on uh, the March third, twenty twenty two uh, board agenda, which is item seven D Davis Demographics and Planning Incorporated Enrollment Projection Update. But I'll also send the attachments uh, to you, Kelly, and you can get them where they need to go. Great, thank you. So we have one more person who had their hand up. I think I inadvertently lowered it. So USMC, if you uh, want to speak, you can um, unmute yourself and you have three minutes. Thank you, ma'am. So yesterday, a big tree branch fell on a safe route to school. And I'm, I'm sure that is not news to any of you, and I'm sure that you're all very concerned about that. So instead of doing nothing, which has generally happened, what could be done is immediately go along the bike paths or walking paths of students and check for overhead trees that could be of danger. And yes, you cannot get every tree, got it. But if you do nothing and someone gets hurt, you're gonna wish you did something. So please, work, you guys work together and start checking the trees along the paths that kids walk and bike. Thank you. Thank you to the public commenter. Um, anyone else here this evening, Kelly? Nope, that's it. All right, so we'll close public comment on this item. And um, all we have left on the agenda is announcements, comments. We have any further announcements or comments from either uh, the city or the school district. All right, quiet bunch. <laughs> all right. Well, seeing none, we'll move to item seven, adjournment. And um, do we need to do that? We, meeting is adjourned, look at that. I couldn't remember if we need to go around and do it, but yeah. nothing left on the agenda, so I think we're, we're good to go. We can well, just thank adjourn. You. Yeah, <laughs> thanks yeah. everybody for, for coming out tonight and for your comments and for sharing the information. It's been great, um, you know, the continued partnership with this group and, and I enjoy, you know, being in these meetings and, and hearing the updates from you folks and all the good work that's happening at the school district. So, so thank you for your time and for your continued flexi flexibility and, and keeping kids uh, safe at school. So thank you for all your work. All right. Thank you, Josh. Thank yeah. you, Will. Right. Thanks, Thanks, Josh. Thanks, everybody. everybody. Take care. Thanks, everyone. Have a good night.